Well, I want to talk to you about this man, Gottlob Frege. And I bet that most of you would never have heard of him before. At least those of you who don't know much about mathematics or philosophy. Uh, because um, in terms of reputation, he's a singly obscure person. However, he's the most important person in the history of 20th century thought. Uh, and his story is a fascinating one. So I'm going to try and tell it to you tonight. Okay, so first of all, that's his, that's his history. As you can see, I mean, he didn't live a terribly exciting life. Born in 1848, studied at Jena and Göttingen, professor at Jena all his professional life, and he died in 1925. Frege was a mathematician, and he worked on the foundations of mathematics. That is, roughly speaking, that area where people investigate the basic concepts of mathematics, how they function, what's true of them, and so on. And he worked for something like 20 years on his magnum opus, um, no publish or perish syndrome then. This was the Grundgesetze der Arithmetik, uh, in which he formulated and justified his views about these basic concepts. And I'll explain to these, try to explain this to you as we go along, but let's just give you the big picture first. So the first volume appeared in 1893, and the second volume was just about to appear in 1903, when as the book was in press, Frege received a letter from this man, Bertrand Russell. And Bertrand Russell, the great, great British logician, had been reading Frege and he'd found a problem with Frege's work. And Frege was devastated by this. So he wrote back to Russell in the following terms. Your discovery of the contradiction caused me the greatest surprise and I would say, almost say consternation since it's shaken the basis on which I intended to build arithmetic. That's theory of numbers. The matter is all the more serious since with the loss of the principle in question, not only the foundations of my arithmetic but also the sole possibility, sole possible foundations of arithmetic seems to vanish. In any case, your discovery is very remarkable and will perhaps result in a great advance in logic, unwelcome as it may seem at first glance. So after he got the letter from Russell and he replied to it, he ripped the book off the press. Uh, and he thought for a while and he added an appendix in which he tried to repair the problem that Russell had found. And the appendix starts like this. Scarcely anything more unwelcome can befall a scientific author than to have one of the foundations of the edifice shaken after his work is done. This is the position into which I was placed by letter of Mr. Bertrand Russell as the printing of this volume was nearing completion. So, in the body of the appendix, he tried to solve the problem that, had, uh, that Russell had found, and he made some suggestions. But it must have been very clear to him uh, very soon that these didn't really work. And... Uh, Effectively, he gave up the project. He didn't stop publishing quite. He did publish some things after that. But effectively, he gave up his life's work. Um, and he did think a bit, about, a bit more about the foundations of mathematics, but it was on a completely different way, which never came to anything like fruition. So Frege realised that his magnum opus had gone down the gurgler. Uh, and he died in 1925, believing that his life's work was a failure. However, few people uh, managed to create a revolution in thought. But actually, Frege did that. He created a revolution in logic. But he created not only one revolution in logic, he actually created two revolutions. He also created a revolution in philosophy. So his work in both logic and philosophy in the 20th century is seminal. Okay, so this is where we're going. First of, all, first of all, I'll explain Frege's work to you and why it ended in failure. Then we'll see how he managed to bring about these two uh, revolutions, which he really had very little conception of because he died in relative isolation. And now I'll just say a few more words about the conundrum, which is Frege. So, first of all, Frege's failure. And to explain the failure, I have to explain to you the context in which he was working. So this is the foundations of mathematics in the 19th century. So in the 19th century, people knew there were lots of different kinds of numbers. 
There are natural numbers, 0, 1, 2. There are integers, which is, you know, those plus the negatives. There are rational numbers, fractions if you like. There are real numbers, things like root 2 and pi and so on. There are complex numbers, like the square root of minus 1. And there were infinitesimals, numbers which were closer to zero than any real number you like. So there's this whole welter of different kinds of numbers. Um, And people didn't really understand them at all. So um, real numbers or irrational numbers had been discovered by the Greeks, but the Greeks didn't know how to handle them. And some 2,000 years later, the situation wasn't any better. People had no idea what a real number was, how to manipulate it properly. And these guys were even worse because they appeared to have contradictory properties. So the foundations of mathematics in the 19th century was a real mess. But what mathematicians did, and most of them were German, it must be said, was introduce rigour into the foundations of mathematics for the first time and try to give a rigorous account of these notions. So the first thing that happened was that this guy, Weierstrass, got rid of infinitesimals. So that was probably the biggest problem out of the way, but that left all the others. But a whole series of German mathematicians tried to explain the other kinds of numbers. And roughly speaking, what they did was this. Um, Complex numbers, they analysed as pairs, a certain sort of set of real numbers. Real numbers, they analysed as sets of rational numbers. Rational numbers, they analysed as sets of sets of pairs of integers. And yes, I mean that. Integers, they analysed as pairs of natural numbers. And that left just natural numbers and sets thereof. So, you see, the whole thing had been reduced to numbers, natural numbers and sets. And I'm not going to go into the details here because they'd be boring, but let's just show how one of these tricks is turned. That's the uh, definition of uh, real numbers. Okay, so this was done by Richard Dedekind. And his solution to what a real number is is very, very simple. Just take a sequence of rational numbers, fractions, Okay? Those can be ordered in the obvious way. Now partition them. Okay? So you, it's two parts such that all of these guys are less than all of these guys, all these guys are greater than all these guys. Well, Dedekind said, that's a real number. Just a pair, just a section of rational numbers. It's very simple, but very effective. So root 2, for example, everyone's favourite irrational number, is just... Um, that partition. And you see, because uh, root 2 has uh, an infinite decimal expansion which never repeats itself, uh, there's no last member of this partition and no first member of that partition. So uh, there's a kind of gap, as it were, but you can represent this gap by this partition. OK, so that's, that's the Dedekind trick. And in the same way, by the time that Frege was working... All kinds of numbers have been defined in terms of sets and natural numbers. And there things stood. So, the next question on the agenda is, what the hell is a natural number? What is zero, one, two, three, four? This was the problem that Frege set himself to work on. And uh, what he wanted to do was define the natural numbers in terms of sets. So, reducing everything just to sets. And then... He wanted to say that the principles about sets are really principles of logic. So in this way, he'd have reduced all of number theory to pure logic. And this was his thesis called logicism. All truths about numbers are truths of pure logic. Okay? So, two stages. Define the natural numbers in terms of sets and then show that sets are part of logic. That was Frege's programme. Okay, the first part is kind of easy. That's the definition of natural numbers in terms of sets. So roughly speaking, Frege said zero is the set with no members, one is the set with a set of all sets with one member, two is the set of all sets with two members, and so on. Now, of course, that's circular as a definition. That doesn't work. But roughly that's what it amounts to. And part of Frege's cleverness was he, he was able to do that without circularity. So that part was sort of under control. What about sets, though? He had to show that sets were really part of logic. So what is a set? Well, Frege said that a set is really just the extension of a condition. So any condition you can put on things, whatever is the bunch of things that satisfies that condition, is a set. So um, 
any condition defines a set. A set just is the extension of a condition. So, for example, the condition is red defines a set of red things. The condition is an even number defines a set of even numbers, and so on. It looks kind of straightforward, right? Um, and having taken or uh, thought that sets are just sort of the extensions of any condition you like, conditions look pretty much like things that belong to logic, so is home and host. So this was his program, and this was what he set out in the um, uh, Grundsgesetze, his magnum opus. So what was the problem that Russell found with this? Well, uh, it was um, to do with Frege's account of sets. So some sets are members of themselves. So, for example, the set of all sets is a set, and so it's a member of the set of all sets. So that set is a member itself. Some sets are not members of themselves. So the set of red things is not itself red, it's an abstract object. A fortiori, it's not red. So the set of all red things is not red, so it's not a member itself. Okay, so some sets are, some sets aren't. What about the set defined by the condition uh, is not a member itself? So think of all those sets which aren't members of themselves, like a set of all red things. Uh, is it a member itself? Well, if you just think about it for a moment, if it is a member itself, then it's one of the things that isn't a member itself. And if it isn't a member itself, well, it's one of the things that's in the set. So if it is, it isn't. It isn't, it is. That's Russell's paradox for you. And that's the paradox that Russell found which destroyed Frege's work. Okay. And as I said, his work never really recovered from this because he had no solution to it. And the solution nowadays, I guess, is still contentious in some ways. So um, it wasn't the only paradox that was turning up at this time. So there were various other paradoxes, for example, by Cantor, one of the foundations, foundation figures of modern set theory, about this biggest set. Okay? Think of that biggest set, the biggest set of everything there is. Okay, well, Cantor actually proved that for any set there's a bigger. Um, so there can't be a bigger set, yet the set that contains everything has to be the biggest set. So this is actually of a piece with Russell's paradox, although that not be, maybe not be obvious. But it, filling in the details is hard. It takes pages and pages of mathematical work, and so you know, people didn't quite know how to react to it. But Russell's paradox, you can explain to a 10-year-old, okay, that's what made it hard, because it, it was clear that the problems weren't just in the kind of recondite machinations. They were buried deep in the conceptual apparatus that was being deployed. All right, 